As we all are making adjustments to the new normal amidst this pandemic, TAG is no different. I'm Scott Williford, CEO and founder of VLink Solutions, and we're the proud sponsor of the first TAG virtual event in response to this ever-changing business community. Our virtual panel today consists of Mike Newmeyer with the Archetti Group, Sarah Stansberry with DTN, Carol O'Kelly with PRGX, and Michael Tuhill with Novellus. Thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your busy days and joining us remotely for this first virtual event hosted by TAG. There's such a new world that we're facing. There's so many things that are, that are happening out there right now. And knowing how to communicate as a company to our employees, our stakeholders, our shareholders, and our customers and the community in general is super important. So Mike Newmeyer, I would love to hear your insights on what are some of the key things that we need to be thinking about when it comes to communicating outside of our company. Thanks, Scott. Glad to, glad to elaborate on that. Um, I think, first of all, we have to recognize that we're in charter ter uh, unchartered territories, rather. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should throw out all the crisis communications uh, plans that we already have in place for our organizations. Um, just because we've never had a situation like this before doesn't mean we shouldn't rely on the thinking we already have in place. And in this particular instance, um, I think organizations are really focusing on three main areas um, in an order of priority that is quite possibly right now, employees first, uh, it's a new world order. We have business continuity plans kicking into place that are drastically changing how organizations operate. So you have to communicate that to your employees. They all need to know what's going on. Uh, then second, what's best for the community? Uh, we like to say put the customer first, but at this moment in time, what's really best for the community to help us flatten that curve that everyone's been talking about? And then third, how can we help our customers? Um, and I think that is kind of the priority in, in uh, Ken Shalnot, the former CEO of American Express, ha has a famous quote, which is, we have to remember that it is in a crisis that reputations are won and lost. So right now truly is a critical time for all organizations. So perhaps one of the other panelists could talk a little bit more about that, about how you guys have priority, prioritized your communications, both internally and externally. And, I, and I'd like to start with, you know, that internal communications. What are some of the things that you're doing to make sure that you're getting the right message to your people? Um, this is Sarah. I just thought I'd kind of go a level deeper than what Mike just said in terms of the employees. Um, to your point, you know, we're really focused on internal, but we have to think of employees and the different roles that they serve. So we have customer facing customers or employees. What do they need to know and what do they need to know to say? Um, we have uh, technology professionals in our organization. How are they helping our other employees? get what they need, the tools that they need to be productive. We have managers, people managers. How do they act with empathy but still keep productivity going? Um, and then we have people who are, who have, you know, jobs are really difficult to work from home. So how do we make sure that they're supported and that we're, we're making sure that we're communicating the information that they need to make sure that they understand how we're staying in business, how we're doing the things that we need to do for our customers, and what their role is in all of this. So it's um, sometimes what I always say is it's, it's really the details. Just as good marketers do, we're always segmenting our audiences um, by message. We have to do that for all audiences, internal and external. That is absolutely true. Uh, Michael Tuhill, you have a global workforce and you said yesterday when we were prepping for this call, uh, that you guys have done some things, especially from the top down, to keep your employees uh, informed. Can you share a little bit about some of the things that y'all have done? Sure. Thanks, Scott, and uh, pleasure to be with you guys. Um, we we have, uh, like most organizations, stood up our our crisis um, team, both uh, operationally and and communication, uh, and we are trying to set a regular cadence um, of 
communication related to COVID-19 uh, every couple of days to inform uh, our, our global workforce uh, what management is doing at the, very, at the very senior level, whether that's restricting travel, whether that's extending um, business critical um, or business essential operations. Um, one of the things that I think was important to do early on was for, have, for our CEO to um, send a message to all our employees globally via video to share uh, with them um, his thoughts, uh, his concern that really the most important thing to our organization is safety and our employees' safety and the health and safety of not only uh, corporate employees who now can work remotely, but shop floor employees of, as well that are coming to our manufacturing sites uh, every morning and continuing to run the operation and ensuring that they are working in, in a safe and healthy um, environment. And, and, and I think that every uh, larger organization is doing the same thing and hopefully some of the smaller ones are as well. Uh, Carol, you had a story that was, that was pretty significant that you shared about a, a client communication, but how it motivated the internal team as well uh, yesterday. Can you share a little bit about that? Absolutely. I, uh, you know, it's interesting to see how marketers are sharing these stories with one another and, and learning from each other. Uh, but uh, a, call, a, a friend of mine shared a story uh, from a, uh, a medical insurer and the way they had approached communicating with their policyholders who are um, large hospitals and doctors who are right now, of course, on the front lines fighting the crisis. And their CEO and chief medical officer had actually communicated out to all of the policyholders and said, hey, we appreciate what you're doing. Uh, we know that uh, that you don't have time to, uh, you know, figure out how to communicate with us right now. So here are our cell phone numbers. If you need anything, let us know what that is. And I think that is back to uh, Mike Newmeyer's point, a great way to build relationship capital. Um, and it's really uniquely um, consistent with what's appropriate for uh, that segment and for their relationship with, uh, with their clients and, and policyholders. And whether anyone ever dials those cell phone numbers or not in this crisis, I think that that's going to pay dividends for that company uh, for a very long time. Well, what I find it interesting, too, is that they shared that email with their policyholders and their stakeholders, but then they shared it internally, and it made the internal staff feel a lot more comfortable about the situation. Correct. That's exactly right, Scott. So uh, my friend shared it with me to say this was then attached to uh, one of the employee communications going out to say, this is how we are communicating with our policyholders. And I thought that was a great example of leadership because it showed from the top down how, you know, leading by example, this is how we're communicating uh, with our policyholders. At PRGX, one of the things that we've done to ensure that consistency is we've created FAQs that we have put on our intranet site for all of our client facing personnel to be able to use in answering questions they may be receiving from our clients. So in addition to pushing out communications from our CEO, and in addition to asking all of the client account leads to uh, be in touch with uh, their leads on all of our accounts and be filtering back to us what they're hearing, we're providing them uh, answers to these key questions that we're hearing. And by putting that information on our intranet, we're able to keep those questions fresh and uh, have that be really a living document uh, that's held in a centralized location where people can come for the latest information. And that's helping us be consistent across the globe. I think, you know, to Sarah's point, talking about managing uh, a number of locations similar to Sarah, we have over 30 office locations and also work on client sites around the globe. It's important to, you know, think of the old adage, um, think globally, but act locally. In this particular crisis, we're seeing the timelines are, um, you know, happening on different levels as the, as the, um, as the virus spreads different in local, uh, you know, different in, in local regions. And so 
while we've had employees working from home in Asia since January, it's only in March that we've made those changes in Europe and uh, the Americas. And so it's important to um, have communication mechanisms in place that allow you to um, communicate effectively what's happening in each of those local uh, local offices and, and you know, to, down to whatever level is appropriate for your business. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think it was Sarah that you were sharing how you guys have responded uh, with keeping your communities and community leaders engaged. Uh, can you share a little bit about what you guys did when this first came about and how you activated your team? Yeah, so one of the things that we quickly realized, so DTN has grown uh, quite significantly through some major acquisitions throughout the world. And what we wanted to make sure is while we knew um, obviously where all of our locations were, we're in 36 different parts of the world, um, we really wanted to make sure that we had a site leader at each one of those locations. And so we quickly called on um, certain employees around our enterprise, uh, assigned them as, as a site leader, just to make sure that we had a very clear way of getting information from each location what's happening from a governmental perspective, if the building is owned or leased um, by, you know, by someone other than DTN, are they making any decisions that we need to be aware of? Um, and then if they needed to have immediate decisions made, we gave them a clear line of sight to an executive member of our leadership team. So they had one person that they could contact if they needed a decision right away. We tried to pair it up with time zones as best we could. Um, but that allowed us to uh, have frequent communications via email. Uh, we have a weekly set meeting with each one of those location leads, but I will tell you, we've now kind of have a community going where we're talking a lot more frequently, but to make sure that everyone knows that there's a point where the entire leadership team will be on a call to answer their questions. And it's important. I think that that's allowed us to respond uh, quickly and to, to Carol's point, uh, with a global lens, but be able to act locally as quickly as possible. So uh, another thing that we talked about is that most of us, uh, and especially organizations the size of PRGX, DTN, and Avellis, you guys had crisis communications plans in place. How are you responding to this ever-changing environment? Because I'm sure you couldn't predict what was going on here. Perhaps one of you could, uh, to, could share a little bit of insight on what you guys are doing there. Whether you had a crisis communications plan or business continuity plans in place or not, um, you have to recognize that these things are fluid. So one of the things that I would encourage all of the small business owners that work with TAG to think about is um, there's no reason to panic if you didn't have a business continuity plan in place because even those of us who did um, are having to be very reactive uh, at, at this time because the best laid plans uh, are, are just that, they're plans. So um, we're doing a lot of trying to um, remain flexible, to communicate. Um, as you've heard, you know, so far on the call, there's just have been trying to get all the right people in the room. And, 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 and we, we have found that those needs have evolved and the, the working groups get larger and larger. And we've tried to um, spin up um, subcommittees of our working groups and acknowledge, okay, here's internal communications, here are external communications, here's what we need to do from a technology perspective, here's what we need to do in terms of just monitoring all those changing regulatory um, situations on a local basis and how we're going to track those things. And so we have different sub working groups and then how do we bring those back together? So, so that's what we're doing. We're also trying to, um, to uh, capture the learning. So we've even set up an internal email address where we have people sending those, um, the learnings uh, into this internal email address so that we can go back and capture those things uh, later and, and, and learn. So that's what we're doing for a large business. But if I'm a small business, I wouldn't panic. I would just sit down and create that plan. And it's about figuring out, back to Mike Newmeyer's point in the beginning, what do I need to do for my employees, for my community, and for my customers? What do I need to do right now? Then what are the decision points? What are the points where I might need to pivot and change those plans as this crisis evolves. And then once you get your, uh, you know, your skis under you, um, start to think about, okay, what do I do if the crisis lasts four weeks? What do I do if it lasts eight weeks? 
and start to think in a very logical fashion and try to start to think about some of those contingencies. Um, but if you didn't have a plan, there's no reason to panic. Um, you have plenty of time uh, now that so many of us are working from home um, to start to figure out those things and, and learn from them uh, for the future and for right now. A absolutely. Uh, one of the things that we talked about when, on our prep call was the importance of communicating to our customers and understanding that they're going through this crisis at the same time. Uh, Michael, if you don't mind, you shared a, a, a pretty powerful story yesterday, and I, now I realize it was a, it's a large industry that, that you guys are in and providing aluminum uh, around the world, uh, and, and one of your biggest industries is automotive. So do you mind sharing a little bit about what you guys are doing to support your customers through this and how you're communicating to them? Uh, thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, so uh, as of uh, uh, yesterday, the... Uh, March 18th, the um, automakers <clears throat> suspended operations, um, <clears throat> excuse me, mostly uh, throughout all of Europe and now here in, in, uh, in North America. And that um, is a, has a big impact on our, on our business. We're the largest uh, aluminum supplier to the automotive business globally. Um, and so now we are, uh, we're actively working on um, contingency plans on uh, how we can uh, continue to manufacture but also at a rate that um, our customers and, and the, the automotive uh, companies are going to be able to receive material. Um, if they come online uh, in a couple of weeks, will we have the, the material available to them uh, when, they are, when they need it? Or are we going to be in a, in a delay situation as well? And now how do we communicate that to them um, that they that we will need to be flexible to get there. This is where your your partnerships and your relationships with customers really come into come into play. Um, and so we're we are now um, uh, creating um, uh, materials that our frontline uh, customer facing uh, account representatives can go to go to customers and say we understand the situation we're in. We're here for you. Um, we'll be back in touch when we know exactly. Uh, what type of delay we may be facing or uh, product that is shipping now is is still shipping and giving them that confidence. The one thing I think, you know, to Carol, I would I would just echo what Carol was making the other uh, point a second ago is not to speculate, right? I mean, we are, uh, everybody wants answers and everybody wants to predict the future, but, you know, speculation is really uh, harmful in a dynamic situation environment that's changing literally hour by hour. And so we're, we're communicating what we know today and promising that if that changes tomorrow, we'll be back in touch and communicating again um, as the information becomes available. So, so Mike Neumeyer, you probably have clients coming to you with similar questions. How do we, how do we get our message out to our uh, clients, our customers, our stakeholders in, in the appropriate manner and, and you being a, one of the premier public relations firms, I'm sure you're getting some phone calls about that. Yeah, we're working with a number of clients on this, to be quite honest, in any way that will help them. Uh, all of um, uh, communications teams right now are stretched because there's massive communications going out to so many different audiences. To tag on to what uh, Michael and Carol said, and, and really regardless of the size of organization, um, the marketer, uh, has to drive things forward, has to uh, be bold during a time like this and continue or initiate communications from within the organization. And oftentimes people are wondering, what are we going to say? There's a simple guidepost that whether you're a $3 billion organization or a $300,000 organization, you can use to, to help figure out. And it, it's very simply, um, what would reasonable people appropriately expect a responsible organization or leader to do when confronted with a situation like that. So if you take that very simple statement and use that as your true north when you're constantly confronted with new things, as we will over the next uh, days and weeks, and honestly answer it, it's going to lead you to what you should be saying and to which audiences you should be saying it. Do you have any uh, examples where you've been working with clients that are, are, are figuring out how to approach this? 
Yeah, I think a lot of clients right now, and it goes more to business continuity, are figuring out how do we supply our managers who are used to managing workforces in a very different way, how do we supply them with information so they can now manage folks remotely and those folks remain productive and remain engaged? Because we still need our workforce, even though they've turned remote, productive and engaged. Um, so that's one area we've been working uh, with a lot of clients on. That's great. That's great. Anybody else have any insights on that? Sarah, you or Carol or Michael? One thing that I would say, you know, our HR department is very strong and has done a great job being a partner to marketing where we focused more on the external communications. HR has taken the lead on the internal communications, but in strong partnership um, through our, our coronavirus task force. Um, but the marketing department, because we've had to figure out how to uh, work as a department in this work from home environment, had begun sharing resources as a team and then floating some of those resources to the HR department to share more broadly. So advice for things like um, how as a family to navigate having so many members of the household together, how to talk to your child about coronavirus. Um, you know how to how to how to you know good habits for working from home how to good tools to use um, for team collaboration so some of the things that maybe are not directly related to the pandemic itself but are um, collateral uh, or tangential to that but about the actual work environment and trying to think about what it means for our employees and our teams and helping them remain as productive as possible. And so I'm um, just trying to be partners to um, our colleagues in the HR department and highlighting some of those things and even some of the communications that some of us are seeing coming from our, um, our schools, our community organizations, our churches, and trying to surface what we see as good, reliable resources and sharing those with the HR department so that we can um, you know, help them be efficient in, in trying to share those things uh, with employees. No, absolutely. And I think that that's the kind of thing that uh, organizations of all sizes need to be uh, looking at and thinking about. Uh, Sarah, do you have any stories that you could share uh, of some of the stuff that you guys have been doing and some of the, the learnings that you've had that's, that might help the rest of us understand how to better uh, respond? So to Carol's point, I think my partner in HR, we've been lock arms in this. I think it's so important that you you really look at it from a, in, a situation like this in, in a comprehensive way. Um, your messages need to be aligned. Uh, you need to really be in lockstep. So we've, we've created a good thing that we like each other <laughs> because we are on the phone or on video conference probably numerous times throughout the day, but we are really working as a team. So uh, that I think is really important to understand who are the, your partners in this situation. For me in my past, sometimes it was, I was lock arms with a legal representative if it was a different types of crisis. Um, sometimes it's a business leader, sometimes it's HR, but to really understand where you have to have tight alignment to, to get that um, moving forward. Um, the one thing that I think that I think Michael mentioned was, you know, while we don't want to speculate and I could not agree more, we do, as marketers and HR professionals, uh, communicators, want to think about the what-if scenarios. So um, I think scenario planning is really important in this case, and not, not to get ahead of your skis, but just to understand what you're saying today, how it could impact messages tomorrow. Um, so uh, while I think we have a, there, there is absolutely forgiveness when you have to change your messaging based on this circumstance, to make sure that you're, you're as clear as possible about your decision today, why you're making that decision, and how you, know, you will update immediately. So people understand kind of the dynamic of it. We've had, um, we have uh, a team in the Philippines and in Spain, and those were changing last week, I think it was changing minute by minute. And so to be able to say, this is the decision right now, and this is a decision, uh, you know, in three hours, <laughs> you know, like I know we just said that, but so I think when Carol mentioned having the FAQs up online that everyone can go access, 
that's what we've promised. Uh, that'll be the source of truth um, and we'll update it frequently. The other thing I was gonna, uh, an example I was going to give uh, for these folks is you wanna think about how this is all gonna unwind itself. So, um, you know, what are the indicators to say that you need in your business to say it's okay to go back to the office? It's expected to go back to the office. You're expected to go back to the office. Um, what is the new normal? What are you going to allow in the future? People saying, hey, I actually love working from home and I want to do it all the time. What is your answer to that and why? Um, you know, I know at DTN, we, we have always used video conference because we are so um, across the globe, but having centers where people are working and collaborating, we know the strength of that and that sense of community is really important to what we deliver to our clients. So start to think about how do you unwind yourself and what decisions and, and what indicators do you need to start going back to, I don't, there's probably a new normal, but what that new normal is going to look like. Well, and Sarah, I, I know a little bit about your previous roles. Uh, and, and so I'd like to shift the conversation. Some of us may have to be communicating to media. And obviously you've had a situation in your past where communicating yeah. externally was, was and to the media was critical. And while that may not be necessarily with us on the panel, but there may be some clients out there or some, uh, there may be some viewers out there that are facing how do I communicate to the media and how to communicate that we're okay and that we're surviving this. I think one thing that we all want to remember is that you know, we've had plan before this happened, companies had plans to do things, whether it was acquire a company, uh, a, a divest, any type of strategy you could imagine. Those were in place. And right now, companies are asking their question, you know, asking themselves, do we move forward? How do we move, move forward? And as you're thinking that through, we should think about what media and influencers are looking for right now. They want to show um, what impact this pandemic is having on the economy. So anywhere that they can tie um, A to B, even if they're not correlated, they might try. So you wanna be very clear in terms of saying, you know, this is either you know, a strategy that's been in place or be transparent. If you have to make business decisions based on what's happening, you know, be clear and explain that. But I think, you want to be aware of what's the story angle out there should it get to some of your influencers out there in the market and and so you clearly identify why you're making these decisions now and and where it is in your overall strategy as a business no and that's excellent advice and, and i appreciate that uh mike newmeyer do you have anything to add to that about media and external uh stakeholders or observers uh that since you are a public relations expert I think you need to walk gingerly during these times. Um, the last thing an organization wants to do is tarnish their reputation by trying to uh, jump on the back of a, a crisis in an awkward or unnecessary way. Um, I think there are, are two great examples that, that uh, we're seeing happen in our community and, and, and with clients. Um, we have a client, for example, that um, uh, delivers video conferencing services across the U.S. to a number of corporations uh, ha and have 20 plus years experience doing so. So that client being able to offer out um, tips, tricks, best practices on video conferencing, on working remote, on using tools, whether it's their tools or the tools they work with or it's free tools, that's a service really. Um, sure, they get some, some nice brand return for being nice guys, but, but they're providing legitimate information that people want right now and as a source for it. And then very locally, we're starting to see um, the restaurant communities, for example, popping up and, and communicating what they are doing uh, in attempt to stay open and uh, help as much as their staffs as possible. A uh, huge movement going on right now around buying gift cards, buy gift cards today to support restaurants tomorrow, but it gives them the cash they need uh, to pay their leases, to hopefully pay some of their employees. Um, and, and there are things like that, that if you're doing as a large or a small organization, you should probably get that message out. Um, right now we are looking for good news, 
to get out and good news stories so that we all have um, uh, uh, strong faith in, in our humanity and in, in our neighbor next door. So um, I don't think we should be afraid of, of getting good news stories out there. No, that's, that's really good. So you touched on, Mike, the, the small business guys. We both know a large uh, percentage of the TAG community are small businesses. So is there anything that any of you could, could say to or speak to that, that as a small business like V-Link is, uh, how, what's some advice you could give those small businesses out there? Uh, and what could, what are some lessons that pass down? So I'm, I'm a former small business person. Um, and, uh, you know, in the last 18 months, so those are not too distant memories at all. And I would just say that small business is the background backbone of this country. And I admire entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurial spirit, um, perhaps more than, than any other characteristics. Uh, and so I believe that the characteristics that that made entrepreneurs and small businesses, you know, ch you know, choose to be what they are, the very things that are going to get them through this crisis. I think that they have certain strengths uh, that those of us in larger businesses um, don't have, uh, such as flexibility, the um, the ability to pivot and change direction and be responsive in times like this. Um, and they should lean into those strengths and. Um, and then I would tell a business of any size to not make promises that they can't keep. Um, and, um, you know, uh, that's something I think that whether you're an individual or, or a company um, to, you know, just be really thoughtful about the, the decisions that you're making, whether that's regarding your employees, your community or your customers um, and to communicate, communicate, communicate. And um, I think that, you know, that we're all going to get through this together. Good, good, good wisdom. I know as a company, uh, V-Link, we're, we're small uh, and how we've pivoted is providing our studio for live streams and remote, remote education. We had a client in here yesterday doing a training class uh, that was pro broadcast to four or five different states because the, the customer of the training company wasn't going to bring their people together, so they did it remotely. Uh, any other comments or feedback uh, that you guys, or any other any other statements you'd like to make before we uh, drop off the line here? Yeah, I think to to, uh, to tag on to what Carol was, was saying, I think your your company culture is really going to guide your decision making through this. Um, if you don't have a strong culture, um, I think you'll you'll realize that and. Um, and it'll be an opportunity when we get through this to to find ways to strengthen your culture and and make decisions based on your purpose as an organization. I think, you know, unfortunately, small businesses don't always have the luxury of dedicating time and resources to, um, to developing a culture, you know, that that global companies do and, and that sort of thing. But uh, and they have to act uh, quickly. And, and, I, and I would guide them to say that. Um, you know, who you are as a culture is going to stay with you, like your reputation um, and your brand long after this and um, taking care of your employees and making choices that are true to who you are as, as a business and, and, a, and, a, and, and a management team, I think will also um, will help um, employee retention, customer satisfaction and, and financial uh, business success going forward. No, that's good advice. Anyone else? Of course, Arketi is made available. Uh, a crisis communications guide that can be downloaded at arketi.com slash crisis guide. Um, uh, it's something that we've been working with NTSC on uh, over the past year or so. So um, anyone that's unsure what to do, it's just full of some great uh, tips at arketi.com slash crisis guide. Well, and thank you, Mike, for making that available. We'll be sure to put a link to that because I think that's a kind of resource that both large and small businesses need to review. There may be some tips or tricks or something that's there that makes this makes sense for us to, to incorporate into our planning. Guys, you all have been awesome. This has been a lot of content. Uh, thanks for participating in the first virtual uh, TAG event. And uh, we'll be posting this live in, 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 in very short order. And uh, just stay tuned for future events. Thank you guys so much.